Hey church, welcome to this week's Daily Growth Book. We are now opening into the book of 1 Timothy. I pray you guys are having a great week so far, and this is going to be a great start of it. So this is the best way to start your week is with the Word of God. Holy Spirit, we give you praise. Ask you to come and speak to us. Thank you that your Word gives us everything that we need. Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. Show us what we need to know right now. We receive it by faith in Jesus' name. So the book of 1 Timothy... I'm just going to read it straight from the Daily Growth book today. We have uh, a synopsis of the book in, in front of every single weekly uh, or new book. Whenever we open up a new book of the Bible, there's a synopsis of the book in the front. And then I'll be reading everything right from the Daily Growth book today. The book of First Timothy is one of Paul's three pastoral epistles. Paul's other letters such as Romans, Ephesians, and Colossians are meant for a broader audience. First Timothy, Second uh, Timothy, and Titus are written to specific people whom Paul is advising on how to best lead their local churches. So these are for leaders of the local church. Well, you'll see we'll get a lot more out of it than even just that. These three letters present a close look at the form and function of church leadership, but it's not just church leadership. Many of these things we'll read will be for all of leadership. First Timothy, like Second Timothy and Titus, is less formal and systematic and more personal than his other letters. This gives great insight into the way pastors, deacons, and elders ought to prioritize their time and their energy. So this is great. We're going to be talking about some time management here as well, which is going to be good. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and start reading 1 Timothy chapter 1, <clears throat> and we'll go right at it. This letter is from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, appointed by the command of God our Savior and Christ Jesus who gives us hope. So this is his greeting. But notice the things he said. This is a letter from me, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. He knows who he is. Appointed by the command of God our Savior and Jesus Christ, who gives us hope. He's unashamed. He knows who he is in Jesus. He knows who sent him. These are valuable things for our life. We've got to be bold. We've got to be proud, not of us and ourselves, but proud of who Jesus is in us and who he's made us we got to know who we are in Jesus Christ, what we're meant to do. I'm a businessman in Jesus Christ. I'm a pastor with Jesus Christ. I'm a cameraman who films, and I do this for the glory of Jesus Christ. I'm a servant in my church. I'm a deacon for Jesus Christ. I'm a father and a mother for Jesus Christ. you got to know what you're called to in the season that you're in. What's the season that you're in? Do you know your purpose, and are you doing it boldly? And are you doing it knowing that you are that because Jesus called you? Know who you are and what you're doing in this season of life. And then he says, I've been appointed by the command of God, our Savior, and Jesus Christ who gives us hope. So he knows who sent him to do it. He knows that this is God who commissioned him to do it. It wasn't his own idea. This is how you should be in your life, in your business. Are you doing that because it was your own idea? Or does God want you in that business? Some people will ask this question and it won't be that easy of an answer. It might be the reason that you're struggling with some things. It might be the reason you're not happy still. It might be the reason that um, you still find a lot of confusion. Because here's the deal. If God called you to something, it doesn't mean it's easy every day, but it does mean you just have a peace. There's a peace that's inside of you that even if it might not be where you think you would be or what it would look like because God called you to it, you just have this peace and I'm in the right place right now. I just know I'm doing the right thing. That's what you need. Do you have that? This is what Paul's saying in this first verse, and this is how he addresses his letters. He knew he was doing what God wanted him to do at that time. Very important that you know that you're doing what God wants you to do right now. Because without that, there's not just not happiness, there's an emptiness. There's a worry, there's a, there's a oh God. I mean, you'll be in fear, you'll be in anxiety because you're just not sure. When you, when you don't know you're where God wants you, you also have an anxiety about your life. You're not at peace. You have fear about unnecessary things. Small things are blown up into unnecessary proportions because you don't feel that guiding protection because being in the will of God, never forget this, is the safest place you can be. It's not inside of a bomb shelter. It's not inside of your house with two masks on. None of that. That's not the safest place you can be. The safest place you can be could be in the middle of a battle, but if it's where God called you to be, it's the safest place you can be. The safest place to be is inside of the will of God. Let's continue. I am writing to Timothy, my true son in the faith, May God the Father in Christ Jesus, our Lord, give you grace, mercy, and peace. I love that. 
When I left from Macedonia, I urged you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. Stop here. There will be people who teach supposedly the Bible, but they're actually teaching contrary to the truth. This is still here today. There are people who are using the Bible. They even maybe even use the name of God, but they're not teaching the word of God. They're not teaching the truth. They're teaching their own version of the truth because today truth is relative. Remember that in our society right now, it's what, whose truth? Your truth, my truth, their truth. Everybody has a truth. Whose truth is it? You know, who, who, whose truth is the truth? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the light. Jesus was like, listen, I'm the truth. I am the truth. So today, you know, it's what truth do you want? Don't fall for that. Stick to the truth and the word of God. Don't let them waste your time, Paul says, with endless discussions of myths and spiritual degrees, pedigrees. Now, listen, he's not talking about unsaved people. He's talking about people in the church. He's talking about people who call themselves believers and followers. He's saying these people can waste your time. You know, we can waste each other's time in church. We're arguing and talking about nonsense. We're not talking about things that pertain to life that's going to change anybody's life or salvation. These things only lead to meaningless speculation. This is Paul's words, not mine, which don't help people live a life of faith in God. <laughs> wow. There are whole debates that we'll have. We'll host debates. We'll talk for hours and argue about small little details. Um, when they're not actually helping, and in the end, nobody was benefited in their faith toward Jesus. Wow. Verse 5, the purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. So there is love that can come from an impure heart, not a clear conscience, and disingenuine faith. <laughs> so if you had to point that out, that there's love that comes from this, there's also a fake love. There's a love that the world gives. There's a love that people have that come from different places. It's an impure heart. It's different motives. It's without a clear conscience and it's disingenuous faith. But some people have missed this whole point. They have turned away from these things and spend their times in meaningless discussions. Once again, don't get involved in meaningless discussions. What's a meaningless discussion? Anything that will not help people live the life of faith in God. They want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses, but they don't know what they're talking about, even though they speak so confidently. So Paul could see right through these people. Verse 8, we know that the law is good when used correctly, for the law was not intended for people to do what is right. It was for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their father or mother or commit other murders. The law is for people who are sexually immoral, or who practice homosexuality, or who are slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or do anything else not, that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news entrusted me by our blessed God. So basically what he's trying to say is the law was created to be able to reveal our sin. The law is for the purpose of humbling people that if they get arrogant or they think that they've made it or they think they're good people, the law was there to reveal that we're all sinners to reveal to these people who are living in sin as well that, oh my gosh, like, wow, I, uh, I'm not holy by myself. I, I do fall short by myself. That's right. You have to realize those things so you can call back on the Lord and take on His holiness. You know, you were a sinner, but if you're saved, you're not considered a sinner anymore, even though you might still sin. So this is really, really important that we know the law is not bad, but it has a specific purpose. Verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. Even though I used to blaspheme in the name of Christ, in my insolence, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, my gosh. Wow. How is generous and gracious our Lord is? How generous and gracious he is. Amen to that. How generous and gracious God is to you. He filled me with faith and love that come from Jesus Christ. This is a trustworthy saving. Here we go. Everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. I could talk about that for a long time. But this is powerful. Paul's going through a journey. Every epistle that he writes, he goes through a journey. This is one of the last ones that he wrote. And he writes in the first one, he says, Paul... Uh, of the apostles, the least of the apostles. The next one, later on, a few years later, 
he writes Paul when he's addressing his letters, Paul, the chief of all sinners. Then in 1 Timothy, he says, I'm the worst of all of them, of all sinners. I'm literally the worst sinner of all. So as you can see, the closer Paul got to Jesus, the humbler Paul got. Not the more arrogant, not the more acting like a celebrity, not the more feeling like he's better than people. It was actually the opposite. The closer Paul got with God, the more that he saw how he came short and the more he was humbled because he learned more about God, God who is the servant, God who is the humble man who humbled himself even unto death, Jesus. The closer you get to God, you should be more humble. You should be wanting to serve more. You shouldn't be becoming more untouchable, more like a celebrity, more feeling like you're owed something, more entitled. That's not how it works. That is a sure proof that you're actually not close to Jesus and you haven't gotten closer to God. That's a, that's a proof that you're being full of yourself. You're being full of your image. You're being full of the things that you present for yourself, not full of the Holy Spirit. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord is. All right, here we go. Verse 16, but had God not had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners, then others will realize too that they can believe in him and receive eternal life. All glory and honor to God, the King, our Father, the unseen one who never dies, and he alone is God. Amen. Last verses, verse 18. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight in the Lord's battles. So prophetic words are not just something that you get when Prophet Rob comes to our church or, you know, when somebody, one of our pastors, gives you a word and calls you out in the audience. Prophetic words are available to you every time you read the Bible. A lot of people think prophetic words are just something that somebody gives you. That's one of the ways that a prophetic word comes out. But a prophetic word is very simple. It's when God speaks to you in the season that you're at for exactly the need that you need at that moment in, that, in your life. So the Bible is always available to you, but God will speak to you certain parts of it, words from God, prophetic words. You can get a prophetic word yourself is what I'm trying to say by opening the Bible into the season exactly that you're in that's giving you the guiding for the time that you're in and the exact answers that you need. So he's saying you fight with those words. So when God gives you that word, either through a vessel of somebody else or through his word, you got to fight with them. you got to remind the enemy. You can't talk to me this way. This is what God told me. you got to remind yourself never to give up because you have that word. You have to fight with those words. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. Some deli have deliberately uh, violated their conscience and their faith has been made shipwrecked. Do you know there's people who have genuine faith, but it's now shipwrecked? shipwrecked because they violate their conscience enough times you actually shipwreck your faith that's crazy last one hypenemus and alexander are two examples i threw them out and handed them over to satan so they might not learn to blaspheme god <laughs> this is a lot i can't get into this but he's talking about two specific examples of these two men who weren't listening to their conscience because you know remember the holy spirit is one of the main ways he speaks to us is through our conscience and the Holy Spirit speaks to us through our conscience, which is purified. And the more we listen to it, the clearer we hear the Holy Spirit's voice tell us what's right and wrong. The more that we ignore that, the more that our conscience gets what they call defiled, a defiled conscience. Paul calls it a shipwrecked conscience. Where the Bible says, Paul describes it as like an iron, like an iron for clothes, where you can sear the clothes and you can burn them. You see, you can actually ignore the conscience or the voice of the Holy Spirit so many times, you'll sear your conscience. You're like, Shh, you'll burn it. So it's not sensitive anymore. You see, if you burn certain nerves deep enough, you can't feel anything. They become numb. So he's saying that if you don't follow your conscience and you don't listen to what it's saying, eventually it's going to be shipwrecked and it's going to become numb. Paul saw this in two men and he mentions their names right there. And he says, listen, I had to boot them out of ministering with me. I had to sit them down. I had to let them and hand them over to Satan. Now, what he's talking about is he didn't commission them to Satan and say, Satan, take over you. He's saying that there is a certain point where certain people get to where they're in such rebellion, closed off to God's voice, that you trying to minister to them and pat them on the shoulder and encourage them in the faith is not actually going to help them anymore. You need to actually turn them over. You need to let them go to God. You need to pray for them from a distance, but you don't need to be in their lives anymore trying to... In other words, you're, you're, they're under judgment, but you're trying to bless them. There are people under judgment, and that is the judgment of God that comes upon somebody so that they'll repent. Never forget what I'm about to say. You have to know when the time comes 
and this isn't with everybody, but some people can only learn the hard way. Please understand, I know it's terrible. I know you love them. I know you hate to see them go through pain. Absolutely. But some people will not learn unless they hit rock bottom. They have to learn the hard way. It's sad, but it's true. And these are people that you cannot keep preaching to. They're people you can't keep trying to hand out and giving them money and all this other stuff that we can do. There's so many different ways in the situations. We have to love them, yes. We have to pray for them, yes. But sometimes you have to hand them over to the hands of God. Paul calls it handing them over to Satan, but all he's saying is, I have to let them go to as deep and as down as they need to go. Now, is this dangerous? Sure. Is it possible bad things could happen? Yeah, but your prayers can also form a hedge of protection around them that even though they could learn their lesson, they still could be protected. That's powerful. We can still do that, but some people have to learn that. They have to go there. So please just understand, pray right now for the people in your life. Is there someone in your life who you're actually not helping by doing what you're doing for them and you have to release them to the Lord so that when they hit rock bottom, they'll finally call out to Jesus? Think about these things. What a powerful chapter today. We pray that you're blessed. God bless you. Continue to be in your growth book. We'll talk to you next week. See you later.